All right, so our final speaker of this year's uh, Nordic Roaster Forum event. Uh, I met for the first time, I don't even remember how many years ago, but quite a long time ago now. Uh, she was working for a small cafe in Oslo that were doing food, had a really shitty Vega espresso machine, used our coffee, and really wanted to do some quality. And I met Joanna, uh, quite young, yeah. eager. You came to our store and trained for a week, went back, disappeared for a year or something to who knows where. And then all of a sudden I hear Joanna is in Sweden competing in bracelet competitions. Next thing I hear, she has uh, become a partner of Drop Coffee. And uh, now I just have so much admiration of what you're doing. Hardworking, uh, traveling a lot, sourcing coffee, roasting great coffee. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Give it up for it, Joanna. Thank you very So the presentation is called Follow the Curves, and it will be about roasting. I'm uh, Joanna, as Tim said, uh, having a roastery in Stockholm called Dark Coffee Roasters. I had somebody asking me yesterday, like, oh, but don't you want to write a book as well? And I just thought about it when I came home, and all I think is like, okay, it would have to be called as much as I know this far, and I haven't even read all of the science available yet. So, in coffee, uh, we, including I, are very tempted to create science. We create the science as we go, and it's kind of a pocketbook science. But a huge part of our understanding of uh, creating science is happening in research, right? So this is what I plan to share with you today. Uh, not the actual finished science, not all of the answers that Morton will help us consistently with, um, but the foundations of my research. I will present a few curves. Um, none of them, I guess, like some will be good, and none will be perfect, but we will look at them and see how I'm thinking and the view I have of roasting coffee. Ready? This is a beautiful picture. Yeah. I think that we can all look at it and we can interpret something, but we still have the hard facts there. I mean, we see the red flowers, we see that the sky is blue-gray, we see the green grass. But if you think about it just like a remote control that you're having to your TV at home, considering that this is being your TV screen. Then you can change the contrast, you can highlight some elements, right? Yeah. yeah. And you can make it more intense, you can make it uh, more bright, darker, etc. We can look at coffee in kind of the same way, I think. I have an example, first example here. Um, this is a picture, oh it becomes even more dark there. <laughs> Uh, um, it's the same picture, it's the same motif. You can see the flowers, but the contrast is not as big. Uh, in my interpretation, and you have to come with me on this one, I think that this is kind of an, um, a coffee that lacks development, and you can't really see the nuances. Right? From the beginning, those flowers could actually have been orange, and the green could be pink, and the sky could have been very blue, etc. We don't see really what we had there from the very beginning. So either we can use this for hiding flavors and trying to create a better coffee than we had from the very beginning, or we can use this with a good coffee as well. And we will not roast all of it away, but we will roast most of it away. This is a failure example of this. Uh, I was having a coffee that were starting to age and I used a higher charge temperature than I wanted, so, which I often find like it's easy to add a certain kind of bitterness to the coffee by that. And what I couldn't do was that I couldn't use as much 
energy as I wanted in the early stage, so that curve instead becomes very flat, and it flattens out. And you can see the rate of rise curve as well, which makes the coffee uh, dull by those changes. Um, I think that if we would stretch this out and tweak it, um, I think we could still actually make a, make a nice curve, like a nice vibrant, like that picture, but we had a, a, a little bit more energy at the early stage and a better for the rate of rise, and we could have had a balanced cup. But I think it gets a picture. Here on the other hand, we do have a under, under structure, unstructured, <laughs> Uh, and unbalanced picture. It's almost sharp, even though it's so considered dark. And my example of this is when I'm trying to give too much energy at the early stage. I um, more or less I get a very short curve, and instead of um, letting the coffee flat off anything, it just runs off, right? and a compromising more or less by having a slightly higher out temperature instead of stretching out the curve. This will, in the cup, mean that the coffee is a bit underdeveloped, but also quite bitter. This one is sharp, I think. Uh, stringent, underdeveloped. Uh, we're lacking very much warm notes in uh, this one. An example of this could have been to talk about the classic um, slow roast that we've had, um, and not given like an extreme um, of that, like to not give much energy at all, but a fairly long curve, and it's not necessarily any roast notes or, or such, but we're not getting all of the, or most of the character out of the cup. Um, this, however, is when uh, I was trying to uh, focusing more on the development time. In this case, it's so so long that it actually flattens out and becomes a bit baked. Um, but what I'm doing here is still that it has a lot of development at the early stage. And what I've found is when you flat off the curve so much in the end, you get like a certain kind of like the acidity is developed, but you create like a kind of spiciness to that. So before we look at the tools, like how, how I'm thinking when I'm roasting, or like down to, down to gas and down to the toolbox, um, we still have to have some things in mind. Uh, all things are not equal. Um, I think that when we do need to look at the conditions that we have and our limitations. What I'm thinking a lot about lately is that the fact that we're dropping the coffee into the rolls to write and it takes about seven seconds for the coffee to arrive in. When we're letting the coffee out, same thing there. Like it's, yeah, on my roast at least, it's seven, eight seconds before everything comes out. And that's 15 seconds and it's kind of much uh, at this stage of the roasting that we would consider a lot. Otherwise, same thing is of course like in the drum, we will never have a fully even uh, heat sprite in there. Um, yeah, and those are just limitations we have to live with. Like either we can focus on, okay, how do we get most of it taste equal or is it okay that we actually focus on that 90% of this coffee we would like to roast as good as we can. It's just to decide. The toolbox. Um, starting with time. Increasing and reducing time, uh, of course, goes hand in hand with how much energy we're giving. We talked a bit about that on the roasting lecture yesterday. Um, this can, of course, have both positive and negative things. If you do have a, a longer curve, it's like I would say that the coffee is getting more gross, 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 like more bigger. Yeah, larger, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and we get a bit of a muted acidity. A short curve can very easily be underdeveloped, 
and um, not all the flavors are, are there and sometimes not all of the sweetness. Uh, energy. This is where I when, was when I needed to go back to like the school basics um, and just like looking at okay, weight, energy, what, what are we actually doing, what is happening in the air from heat on those things. And uh, one of the main things of course is to understand that heat never disappears, just changes form. Um, and that when we are roasting, we are actually, that's when we are starting to like add energy to break the bones within the coffee beans and we are starting to create flavors. We can make the coffee go from sucrose to fructose to like, uh, that wasn't even in the, in the row coffee from the beginning, but that's more or less what we, what we are doing and the coffee needs roasting to develop flavors. Uh, when we are impacting a lot of energy at one stage, we are like, the coffee is starting to react Think about it like if you want to, you could like put it higher, lower, up and down to follow the rate of rise curve or, or for the curve. But then we are like adding and reducing energy all the times to the beam. So for example, uh, like say like the early stage of roasting, many of us have seen that it's good to add a lot of energy then and we are starting to develop the like bigger acids in the coffee that helps us to build, build out more, more flavors. And that is then a great example where we like rather give a lot of energy. Um, shot temperature. Uh, I've been looking at this a lot uh, lately. Uh, I was taught like when I started to roast, I was taught like okay, but the bigger of the beans you have, like rather shouldn't you have even higher shot temperature and do it there? But uh, my experience is that it's super tricky to actually not burn the outside and to develop the bigger beans. Properly, um, of course, this is super individual. I think, like what I found is that having it too high charge temperature uh, can create a certain kind of bitterness to the coffee. But also, uh, the main reason why I don't want to keep it too high is that I wish to, at the early stage, be able to give a lot of energy that I would like to keep on for the rest of the product. Airflow. Uh, this is a tricky one. Um, I think it was uh, Isabella uh, when she was giving a lecture here last year uh, that described it fairly good as like if uh, think about this if you're gonna start to open a, um, uh, a door but it's super windy outside and you try to push it, push it, push it but it's super hot for the for the particles to to spread out in the atmosphere and for their reactions to happen. So, and in, with the weather in Scandinavia, like it goes so much up and down, and what is happening is actually that this airflow on the outside has a massive impact on the airflow within the drum and the chimney stock. So either we can choose to more or less like set a fixed airflow that we are roasting with throughout the cup, it can be super good, or we can actually try to, to change it step by step. Um, I don't have an uh, answer there yet. I tried both and I truly like both. I think the most important is that you have a high enough airflow to blow out all the shaft, of course. Um, but also that you see, like say if I have too high of an airflow, like in flavor, that's giving me more like dryness and it becomes like the beans are a bit harder as well. While if it's more easy for the beans to open up and especially if you have a lower airflow at kind of an early stage. So at the moment now when I'm roasting like fairly short curves, I have a lower airflow in the beginning so I then can roast it through like fairly quickly in the process. Exothermical reactions. Um, uh, I guess you know this, but I think that um, we, we are still struggling with and sometimes are coming to loops, like what is it that actually happens here? When we are going towards crack, we are of course building up a high pressure within the beam of carbon dioxide and the beams are expanding and this is giving further energy to the reaction. Uh, I call it flick of hell, uh, it's, some, it, it's some other term that is out there as well. Um, this is more or less just like when um, Aston bomb is reaching the, the ground. It's actually not the 
bomb itself that is exploding, it's when it lands on the floor and those reactions are created, they have energy. Right? So say, if this is going to the floor, the reaction is happening afterwards. Right? Yeah. So what it could do is to do something like that. But it's never going to be like, what I struggle with is that I can't really um, I can't really see how much energy is on this stage and exactly where, since all of the beans as well are cracking a bit different on different stages. But I think that the most important is that, say, if we do it before, if we do, uh, if I do it here, I will first impact the coffee a lot by reducing energy, and then it comes a lot of new energy. Or if I do it here, might be the best. If I do it on the ground, it's too late. Of course. Um, personally, I find it like if we have a more flat uh, finish, we sometimes get an even more intense uh, cup, but it's very hard to keep it clean. Uh, I normally go more, more towards that it rises an extra degree in that end, uh, rather, and I think I find it being a cleaner cup. But uh, that's where I am now. So. Find it. No. Sharp curves. Um, I was being a bit of ironic when I set the, the title for, for this talk. Um, I think that, like, I always get, like, from our production roles, that, like, snaps. Ooh, I needed it. Like, it was spot on. And, you know, like, those screenshots from Crosser. And I, I think this is, um, like, even if you do have a gas reader, even if we do, like, set the airflow of the weather and the coffee has been like the raw coffee has been stored as we want to and it's the same temperature when it's wrong. It's very, very tricky to actually like consistently deliver uh, a same the same curves with the same conditions of, on one roast. Um, and there's a few like different ways that we can see it. Like is it actually to follow a curve, to follow actual curve? Even if we are, we mentioned yesterday, like if we are under um, in in turning point, for example, do we then add more heat? I mean, that does also mean that we do have a bigger improvement of something that is actually colder on that point, and we're adding more heat. Like, how do we how do we work with this? But I think the most important, just like when we talked about gas, that is that we do a movement for the movement sake, and not just add a little add a little here and there, like to to properly act on it, then either you have to make a quick decision, like either you decide that you're going to make a, the curve longer or the same changes at the same temperature, or you just, just decide, like, okay, this is, uh, now I'd like to go on that curve directly. Um, we are talking a lot about, like, finding um, the right curves. Uh, I personally, personally don't have, like, five different solutions in getting out uh, a certain kind of acidity or a sugar Sweden has. So more or less it's the same like ground theory that I'm using for all the coffee. I would always like most of the acidity that the coffee is good at to be developed, I would like. So I have kind of the same goals with all of the curves and then it's just a tweak. But it's in the same in kind of the same stages throughout the the roasting that I'm doing, the same kind of changes. Taste. I think this is like what, at least if we talk about um, what has driven me, it's just like, the more you travel, the more you see the origin, the more you, like it's so many things that can drive you further in coffee. But I think the main goal for like making the coffee taste better is to just have a very clear goal in what you wish to achieve and this is like all the time each second day we're learning something new and we are processing and but as long as we know like okay that is where we're going and um, I think it's kind of like Slavon Ibrahimovic like listen but don't hear like so uh, listen a lot to to no hear but not listen it must be like hear a lot of the feedback but still like have a very very clear goal of where you want to go and how you can reach that. And as long as you know that you're roasting coffee better than you did three years ago, then it's just to continue to, 
to push that and take side tracks, but have a very clear mind, even if it is roasting chocolate and coffee, or always have a blend, or always do that, like, but just a clear vision of your goals. And normally when I receive a new coffee, I do like something like this, uh, very, very easy, since my technology is like this. Um, so more or less I write, like I roast three different curves on one coffee, and then I just try to like see what do we have here, how much is available, um, what do we have to work, and then we can set goals and see like what do we wish to achieve with this coffee, and what do we need to watch out on in this one. And in the same, like it's very easy to follow in the same table to fill out with like the the moist or the, the TDS at the cupping table, or so you have all your your data and goals. So you're always like. Each week at production, you're working towards the same. Um, hand in hand with dreams and uh, hear what not listen, um, I think that the methodology comes. Um, set your goals, decide what you wish to do at your roastery or where you are in in life. I think that like I, I see it super clear. Like when I when I get a new coffee, it's very clear. Like it doesn't matter if it's a Brazilian coffee or it's a, if it's a Kenyan coffee, I kind of always have the same goals. I would always like to present a coffee with uh, an acidity as its best and as its most, so I wouldn't take it down, like, no matter if they will have different intensity, but maximize it for that certain coffee, as long as it's good. Uh, as clean cup as possible, um, the coffee's character as intense as possible, have um, what I would call a sweet cleanness. I'm personally not a, a fan of like fudgy, uh, big um, kind of sweetness or too caramelly. So, and to of course like find a little spot where the coffee is roasted through. We managed to do that without adding roast notes. So back to the original picture. But it's not. This is the original picture. And this is kind of how I see it when we are getting a new copy. It's delicate, it's from the other one, it's just considered like being some small changes. <coughs> just like when you do get like, if, if you instead of getting like a totally new TV at home, and you set your, your settings for your eyes and what you like. So you tweak it to how you would like it to be perceived. Uh, this is my picture. Um, I would like to deliver as much as I can through the fantastic raw coffees that we are getting help to source and are buying. Um, and I think it's just like to to be able to deliver all of the vividness and sharpness. Like I'm not saying I'm succeeding in it, but that's my strive all the time. What I wish to create. Um, since I would like to do this, it's also like, the elephant in the room that I do not roast for, for espresso. Uh, I roast all the coffee equally. Um, and at the start I was kind of critical of this, but now I just see like, okay, but how do we actually do this without, how do we present a coffee as it most, without to actually um, take away some of its vividness or some of its beauty. When I ask most of the branch colleagues when I am around what they do for espresso roast, they seem to say that they do this. They roast it a little bit darker. They are taking away some of the like high acidity notes or some of the sparkle. And um, of course, like they have the or we all have the baristas to talk to, and it's easier to extract. Um, and there's many reasons why you can do this or why you just prefer to do it. Um, but it's duller and it's a bit further away, in my opinion, how I see it. But I want to deal with that, with the picture. Um, yeah, so this is my picture. I'm trying to not um, change it too much for like either the personality of the roaster or a lazy barista 
for such, it should of course also be said that the um, uh, the barista is having equal much to um, tools that they can use. We have had it like it seems like uh, done to death on the internet and different forums, but I think it's not. It's grand things happening, and uh, no one could be more thankful than me. I think if you like when they are having um, kind of the same goal to try to not get a if it's a not too bitter espresso, not too sharp, or whatever it might be. Um, so grinding, tamping, yield, temperature, water, it should, I like all of those stuff is just making the coffee closer to, to the picture of them, uh, where I want it to be. Um, yeah. I brought like two cups as well that I was happy with, so you can see that I'm actually, like, so it's not only bragging. This is actually what I am happy with. Um, yeah, it's Benjamin Rose for this. It's a coffee from uh, Ethiopia, uh, the Arisha. You can see just like the flick of hell that you talked about, and it's still having like very much uh, of that. And this we have like walked a line and experimented a lot on. Uh, still it does, not too high uh, charge temperature, and a lot of energy like early in the process. Um, small, dense beans. We do have um, this was a coffee from uh, Huila that was more like more softened up and not those like very dense beans, um, and it was very fun to to play around with for that certain kind of character. But it was already so like uh, open, so it was rather to try to make it just even more more lively and uh, keep the acidity uh, alive in it, and it had like sweetness. Uh, is something I've also been focusing a lot on uh, the last year and how important sweetness is. And that I find in general was one of those curves where one of them that I find it the most and experiment the most on. So to actually have a more sharp, uh, like towards crack, if you want in the Amalia direction, to have a, a, a sharper stage there uh, where you get more of the use of process than the caramel. I think that's it. Thank you, Anna. Thanks very much.